Welcome to this uh, Robotics 2 lecture on collision detection and robot reaction. This is uh, the second of, uh, uh, of the topics about research that has been conducted in our uh, lab over the last few years uh, to be included in this uh, series of uh, teaching lecture. So, uh, I will present, in fact, the problem of handling robot collision in a more uh, large perspective, namely that of safety in physical human-robot interaction, which has the English acronym of PHRI. Uh, this topic uh, has become uh, of paramount importance in the, late, in the last, last few years, because of uh, the more, more increasing need of having robot working next to uh, workers in an industrial setting and later on in a very short future, probably also in other environments at home and so on. Uh, our work has been funded over the years by a number of European projects that we gratefully uh, acknowledge. First, the FRIENDS project. Uh, FRIENDS is an acronym that, acronym that stands for Physical Human Robot Interaction and Dependability and Safety. Uh, then uh, we moved to Safari. In fact, uh, I had the privilege of uh, leading this European project as a scientific coordinator. Safari stands for Safe and Autonomous Physical Human Aware Robot Interaction. You see that physical and interaction are coming uh, in different uh, ways in these acronyms. And uh, last but not least, uh, we worked in the project Simplexity, which was more uh, industrial oriented, and we will see some results of this project uh, in, the, uh, in this and probably more in the last uh, lecture on human robot collaboration. So, uh, what do we need in order to achieve safety uh, in uh, this uh, human robot interaction? we need what is called dependability. Dependability is something that goes beyond reliability of components, of software and so on. It means that we have a, a user, a human user should have the feeling of being dependable on these robots that are living next uh, to them. And this requires a number of uh, steps in order to be pursued. The first one is mechanics, uh, so uh, we need to have lightweight robots. We need to have robots that may display compliance uh, both at the hardware level and at the uh, control level. Indeed, we will never uh, realize, uh, say, physical interaction with huge robots that weigh uh, 1,500 kilograms or so. Uh, this makes no sense at all. Uh, there's another aspect which is important, namely that uh, more and more, and I would say the next generation of robots, will uh, have uh, not only compliant actuation, so joints that are uh, uh, connect motors uh, and driven links through uh, a compliant transmission, but variable stiffness actuation devices. So the possibility of including a, a uh, an online scheme, so a second motor, if you wish, that allows uh, to change the stiffness uh, in real time to adapt to the various situations. Uh, apart from that, so apart from these uh, devices which are in internal to the robot, uh, we may need uh, typically more and more uh, extraceptive sensing because we have to monitor the environment, we have to understand um, what are the intentions of the human, and so on. In fact, uh, motion planning is also very important, motion planning for the robot. So, uh, in Safari, uh, the consortium developed a human-oriented motion planning scheme that uh, generates legible uh, trajectory of the robot so that the human can understand what the robot will do. For instance, in the handover task, so while the robot is giving something to the human. And uh, indeed, also control strategy should embed safety objectives and also constraints 
uh, in their design uh, and should be uh, not only and probably not mainly devoted to accuracy and repeatability, but really to understand uh, some uncertainty or uh, unpredictable situation and move the robot accordingly. So, uh, there are various phases in this interaction and why uh, now we are interested, in fact, in collision. So, collision, in fact, should never occur, so we should prevent by planning, by controlling, by monitoring that such events occur uh, and if we are getting closer we should let the robot avoid as much as possible these co co collisions, so unintended contacts between the robot and uh, the environment, in particular the human, this is our main goal, but in fact uh, this is important also for other type of dynamic uh, environment. Uh, but if this happens, and this may happen because uh, we want to bring closer and closer the lightweight robot with the human, and the human may do very fast motion which uh, are unexpected, and even if monitored, the robot is not able to uh, avoid them, so eventually we should be able to detect and react to collision. And react means not only stopping, as we will see, but probably also escaping this dangerous situation. Now, uh, I mentioned extraceptive sensing. You can imagine that you may have cameras or laser sensing, uh, proximity sensor that uh, recognize this situation. But in fact, to detect and react the collision, the most robust way would be to use only proprioceptive sensor in the robot. So, the sensor with which the robot is already equipped, because these are very reliable, they don't need uh, external appendage uh, or setting up situation, uh, si setting up a sensory system around the robot. So we will pursue this avenue, to detect and react collision using only proprioceptive sensor. Uh, in fact, there are in this context, uh, we developed also um, a framework which we call Collision Event Pipeline, where different phases uh, can occur, and we will see what is important and what are the goals within uh, the single phases. So, the Collision Event pi Pipeline, I'm referring to a paper that uh, was published in 2017 after uh, long preparation, I should say, so this work started uh, 10 years before, maybe. Uh, so you, you can see that uh, there's a, a number of issues. You can recognize also terminology that we have used also for fault detection and isolation uh, of actuator faults in uh, a previous lecture. In fact, uh, as I anticipated, we see uh, the collisions as a fault occurring in the system. But this is not the whole story. So you can recognize in this long chain a pre-collision phase. Pre-collision means um, the robot is coexisting with the human, uh, is doing this task, uh, its task, and the human is doing his or her task as well. Uh, so we try to uh, bring them together, close together, but in fact avoid any collision. And in order to do this, we should know the context in which the operation is being uh, performed. But if this happens, if, uh, if collision cannot be avoided, we have to detect. And detection, as a fault, may just uh, a non-off event. So, false or true uh, is what we are looking for. And we need some monitoring signal in order to uh, detect collision. The next step at the same time, if you wish, is also isolation, like we did FDI for actuators, we will do FDI for, I, for a collision. And isolating a collision in a robot means essentially understand where this happened. So, more specifically, what is the, which is the contact point uh, at which co uh, collision occurred, and this is important also for later for later stages in this, uh, in this uh, framework. But at least, uh, if not uh, so precise, at least which link has collided uh, among the N-link. 
of the robot. Because this uh, collision may occur and contact in general may occur at any level, not only at the end effector level. This may be more interesting for industrial application where the end effector is the most dangerous part of the robot because it holds a tool uh, and this tool may be dangerous for the human. But in fact, uh, we can cover all situations at the same time with our approach. Uh, after isolation or only or also uh, together in parallel with isolation, we would like to identify the type of collision, which means essentially to understand what are uh, the history of contact forces, of external forces uh, interacting, acting on the, on the robot. And this may be done at the Cartesian level or also at the level of resulting joint torques coming from external signals. So tau and, and, and f stands for this quantity. Tau are generalized um, torques. I mean, we are assume that the robot has a uh, revolute joint, but this is not necessary at all. So that could be uh, joint torques or joint force, while uh, the calligraphic f stands in general for forces and moments or generalized forces in the Cartesian space. And once we have detected, isolated, and identify this uh, collision, we may start classifying the na their nature. So if they are accidental, and so they should be treated really as collision, or if they are intentional contacts, which may uh, be uh, the understanding that uh, the contact is intentional because we would like to kinesthetically or physically interact with the robot and start a phase of collaboration, which is something completely different and that we will treat, in fact, in, in the next and uh, last lecture of our Robotics 2 course. course. If it's uh, accidental, so if it's a collision, if it's light or severe, and then, like uh, we uh, discussed about general faults for dynamic system, uh, this may be transient, incipient, repetitive, uh, um, and so on and so on. Now, uh, in all these phases, uh, we have been using monitoring signal, but when we classify, of course, we need to know also the context. This is important. So the two lines that are going through this uh, series, this pipeline uh, of the collision event, as we organize this, at this step stage, the classification needs to know what the robot is doing, what was the context at which, in which this contact occurred. And similarly for the reaction. So the robot, once uh, this has been done, and pay attention, these phases may be really simultaneous. Everything may happen in the uh, time span of a few milliseconds. Okay? So the reaction of the robot may just stop or slow down uh, or do a reflex control, and there are many other things that can be done at this level. And we will see a few of possible robot reaction, not just stopping the robot. Of course, uh, you react more intelligently if you understand, if you understood more about the collision. If you just detect a collision and it's an on-off, then probably the only reaction that you have available is to stop the robot. But if you understand uh, where, if you understood where uh, this collision happened and why it happens and what type of nature, your reaction may be much more sophisticated than that. And of course, once you react, you have a post-collision phase. For instance, you start a collaboration if you understood that uh, the, there was a soft intentional contact and this is a mean of saying by the user that he, 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 want, he or she uh, would like to start a, 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 an interaction where contact should not be avoided but should be part of a, collabor or a physical collaboration um, task. Okay, with this in mind, uh, what about the current state in industry? In fact, this slide may be a, a bit outdated because uh, more and more uh, industrial robots are coming with a sensi uh, sensitivity feature. So the fact that they are able to detect uh, a contact and then react to them. They are compliant, as we have seen in our introductory lecture uh, of Robotics 1. In fact, uh, KUKA lightweight robot 
but also ABB, uh, Yumi robots, and other uh, genera new generation of uh, lightwave robots, like the universal robot that we have also in our lab, uh, they are capable of understanding that uh, some extra contact has occurred. But in fact, most of the time, they are only focusing on detection of contacts and labeling them as uh, collision in this context. How do they do? So I'm listing now a number of possibilities. This possibility has been explored also at the research level. So I'm not saying that uh, various companies are using one or the other of this method, but these are all the uh, options that are available for doing this. I will come back uh, later in particular to one of the methods that we developed, which was in fact uh, implemented in uh, KUKA industrial robots of the lightweight generation, AIVA and so on. Okay, so, uh, as I said, most of this method allow only detection and not isolation. And what can you do? So, first of all, you may imagine that you're controlling your robots with some scheme, so you're sending motor currents and you're measuring motor currents, or you have a, a command uh, that you rely on it. In fact, if the actuators are not failing, uh, the torque that you're commanding are those that are also going to the robot. So, uh, all of a sudden, you may see at some instant TK uh, of your uh, discretized uh, um, time, uh, because in fact you're using uh, uh, digital control, that your torques, or if you wish, your motor currents, are very different from the previous uh, sampling instant. So they are larger than some epsilon, which may be constant or may become uh, a function of the trajectory that you're doing, but this is, uh, for the time being, irrelevant, because we will not pursue that. And of course this can be organized in a vector level for all the torques, or uh, joint by joint, and at least one joint has this sudden jump. So this may be uh, uh, a suggestion, may suggest that a collision may have occurred, and this is one method for detecting collision. Uh, you may also be more sophisticated if you have uh, the first method, of course, requires no model at all, no dynamic model at all of the robot, it's just based on uh, the variation of the commands that you're sending. And of course, if you have a collision and you're trying to do the task, the variation, uh, for instance, if you're having a, a PD control, uh, indeed you will see a larger error and then a larger torque, and this is why you suspect that uh, a contact, a collision may have occurred. The more severe is the collision, the larger will be the uh, deviation. Uh, if you're following a trajectory and you're doing position control, so you're really relying um, very on accurate execution of a desired uh, QD of time, you can have a model and you can compute, including possibly also friction in, in this context, so the last term in this expression, you may uh, have computed in line or um, before starting a uh, profile, a nominal profile uh, of the expected torque, and this is in fact uh, an inverse dynamic computation. And when you're really rallying, running uh, your, your uh, experiment, you're running your execution of the task, no matter if you're using this torque or not, but if the torque is very different from what you expect, because your controller is imposing the right a trajectory, then this may be another uh, indication that a collision may have occurred. More than that, uh, you can uh, um, not use just the desired trajectory, but use the current measurement of the state of the robot, so Q and Q dot. You don't have a measurement of the acceleration, so you may estimate numerically the acceleration. I'm calling the signals Q double dot n as numerical estimate, and if you plug into uh, the model that you're using uh, together with the measurement of the robot state, you may have an expected nominal torque, and if this is uh, the torque that you're really uh, 
measuring through the motor carbons, for instance, is very different from this, then again, the cause may be a missing term which is coming from uh, the colliding force acting then on the joints as a reflection. And finally, uh, you may also uh, not estimate the acceleration, but compute it uh, from uh, a simulation that you're running in parallel. You're sending the command uh, that you're sending to the robot also to a simulator. Uh, you simulate your system, which means that you're computing the acceleration, namely you have to invert the inertia matrix of your robot and with this uh, acceleration you integrate once and twice to get the new state. So if this uh, computed new state QC and QC dot is different from what you're measuring in terms of position and on velocity at some instant and it's very large, this difference or uh, exceeds some threshold, the epsilon stands for threshold everywhere, then you suspect that something has happened and in fact uh, an indication, another indication of collision. You see that there are, all these are variation of uh, processing signal. The first method only is signal based, all the others are uh, model based, but they use in fact the model and some, something more like inverting the inertia matrix in real time or estimating in real time the acceleration and so on, or relying on your controller for executing accurately a position trajectory. So, but in all cases, first of all, only detection is uh, maybe guaranteed or maybe expected and not isolation. So you have no idea uh, which joint, which link has uh, undergo a collision at this stage. And all these methods are quite sensitive to which type of controller you're using, torque control or position control, uh, what type of motion are you uh, doing while in your regular operation of the task, of the, of the robot, uh, and this of course makes harder to uh, define also threshold, at least for this reason you have a sensitivity to this type of situation. Uh, and in particular the last two methods, uh, be beyond the availability of a model, which we will need also in our method. In fact, identification of a good uh, model is a, a basic st a step in all this uh, process. So if you're, uh, you may require uh, acceleration estimate, which are typically noisy, or uh, the inversion of the robot inertia matrix, which is uh, computationally expensive, in a sense. Okay, so uh, still uh, something can be done. In fact, no matter which method ABB is using, here is an old video that shows a massive uh, industrial robot with a heavy payload uh, hitting uh, an old car body and stopping his reaction. So this was intended probably to use some current measurement information to understand that uh, a collision occurred, so the trajectory of the robot was going uh, through the car in principle. When the uh, collision occurred, the robot was stopped. So this is something that can be done. Of course, uh, we are now interested in much light, lighter robot than this case, but just to have a, uh, an indication that something could have been done also before, many years ago, with this purely detection provided by the ABB software. Okay, so let's uh, focus on uh, our method um, and consider the model, the dynamic model of the robot in this form. And uh, first thing to note is in the inertia matrix, the Coriolis and centrifugal term have been factorized and this is, this is very important now, this should be a good factorization, namely one that guarantees the property that m dot minus 2s is q symmetric, like we have seen, for instance, in adaptive control or in passivity-based uh, tra trajectory tracking controller, we need this factor factorization in particular. On the right-hand side, we have the control torque, tau, uh, so we are changing notation here, we call the control torque tau, and we have another tau, 
which is the joint torque caused by a link collision, if present. Otherwise, this is zero. Uh, this formalism, apart from moving from u to tau, is very similar to what we have seen uh, in case of um, actuator faults. The only difference is that we model that faults with the subtraction on the right hand side. So we wrote at that time u minus uf, where uf represents a fault which subtract uh, actual torque to the um, command. Maybe for this reason I prefer here to use a plus because this is in fact an additional torque which will move even more or try to move even more if not contrasting in fact the, uh, the, the robot because of this condition. So the tau total is the sum of the applied control torque, our intended uh, command, plus the effect of a link collision. So tau top will be uh, all the right hand side. Uh, of course this tau, tau k, the, another common, the k stands for colli collision, so collision in German, because this work, uh, I performed this work originally uh, and, and uh, I developed this work, the idea was already there, uh, during my sabbatical at, at DLR. This is why the first video that you will see uh, have been shot uh, at DLR in Munich. So this tau k uh, comes from some generalized force, so force or moments or combination, that occurs somewhere uh, along the structure, at the end effector or uh, uh, in, a, in a different area of the robot structure. So uh, this force is being transformed into a joint collision torque by the Jacobian transpose. But this is a Jacobian transpose which is associated to where uh, the collision occurred. So uh, in general we don't know what is the force or moment being applied. We don't even know the position so we don't know even the uh, Jacobian of the contact point, so the JK. So the whole tau K is certainly uh, not known in advance. Okay, so this is a very obvious uh, observation. So we know tau, but we don't know tau K because of a number of reasons that I just mentioned. So collision may occur at any unknown location along the whole robot structure. This gives much power to our method and also. Uh, allows us to ask ourselves if we are able not only to detect the collision but also to identify, uh, to the, sorry, to isolate the link at which this occurred and we will see that uh, one of the methods that I uh, will discuss allows also to do this. There are some simplifying assumptions, some of them may be relaxed. For instance, we assume that our robot manipulator is an open has an open kinematic chain structure you may modify uh, the method uh, for other situations. For instance, if you have a closed kinematic chain, like in humanoid, uh, the, what, the, what I will call the momentum-based method, in fact, has been modified to cover also this situation. The principle remains the same. The second simplified assumption, which is not strictly needed, is that we have a single contact or collision at the time. Uh, we may also have multiple collisions at the same time. We can detect this uh, and also probably isolation would be more difficult in that case. Another simplifying assumption, as you can see in the model, there are no friction term. You may uh, assume that friction is negligible at this stage or better, that has uh, been identified, uh, and if friction is present, has to be identified, in fact, and used in the model. So wherever you will find in the expression of our monitoring signal uh, terms coming from the model, if friction is relevant, also friction should be included, unless I will specify that this is not needed uh, later on. Okay, so these are our simplifying ex um, assumptions, and the method that we've developed are based on first principle, let's say physical principle. So we are not relying uh, too much on uh, a methodology that uh, is related to a specific problem. 
but it's a general methodology. Uh, before doing that, let's analyze what happens for a collision. So this is uh, our old friends, the two R planar arm, under gravity or not, it's not relevant at this stage. And here you can see uh, a couple of possible forces, pure forces in this case, that collide. Uh, in general, you have a kinematic of the colliding uh, area. So you may define a Jacobian that relates the joint velocity to the area on a specific link where this uh, colliding generalized force um, happened. So you may have the Jacobian, which is decomposing the linear and the angular part, uh, and associated you have uh, a generalized force, which lives in R6 in general, in general, so the linear component and momentum component. But for the time being, assume that this capital FK is just the two-dimensional force acting on the first link in a specific position and on the second link. Now, if uh, these forces are applied in a quasi-static way, so in a situation where we are holding the robot at rest through control and we apply these forces. Now, these forces, uh, if a force is applied to a generic link I, in this case I is only equal 1 or 2, then uh, this force, in order to keep static condition, should be balanced by torque that are applied only at joints that precede the link at which uh, this force, this contact force has been applied. <coughs> For instance, if we are considering the first case, the FK on the right, the one coming downward uh, on the first link, of course, uh, in order to balance this force and keep the robot at rest, uh, we need to apply only an additional torque uh, at the joint 1, as related by the JK1 in this case. On the other hand, if we are applying the force on the second link, represented by the second uh, orange arrow, FK, then in order to balance this force and keep the robot in equilibrium, then uh, the, we will need a joint torque both at joint 1 and joint 2. So you see that uh, if you continue with the story, uh, in the generic case, uh, if the static contact force from the environment is being applied uh, on the robot being held in a certain position through control, then we will need to balance this uh, external contact force only torques at preceding joints. And, and the assumption that we have a serial manipulator here matters. But this is not the case of a collision. Of course, we can have a collision also while the robot is at rest and not moving and controlled to stay in this position. So this is uh, relevant also in this case, but more relevant is dynamic condition. So if we have a collision, for instance, on link one, and while the robot is moving, then this will produce, uh, contribute to accelerating, in general, all the joints and therefore all the links. And same for the uh, collision at the second joint. So you have, through the inertial couplings and through the effect of Coriolis and centrifugal terms, and also gravity matters here, when the robot is in motion, so when we really care about collision, then we will have a mix-up of situation. So this FK, a generic FK, will generate a tau K through the proper Jacobian uh, um, only on the, that joints, but the acceleration, which will modify the motion of the robot, will be produced at all joints. Okay, so this is a very important uh, observation, and we will try to counteract to this, making the dynamic situation very similar to a static one. In this way, later on, we will see that we are able also to isolate which link, at which link the uh, collision, the dynamic collision occur. Okay, with this in mind, let's recall some relevant dynamic properties that we have already seen while doing dynamic modeling. 
The first one is related to the total energy of the system. So the sum of the kinetic energy and of the potential energy. We are now assuming that the robot is fully rigid. The model that we have seen, in fact, is a model, dynamic model of a rigid robot. We have seen that uh, there's a property, very important, that says that the variation of the uh, total energy of the system is equal to the work done uh, uh, by the applied external forces. Now, in this case, there's not only tau, so E dot is equal to uh, the scalar product of the velocities times the total applied external um, or non-conservative, but in fact, uh, torque. In fact, if we assume that um, we have a negligible uh, friction, all these torques are only contributing to motion, and the tau tot in our case will be the torque produced by the motors, but also the possibly uh, joint torque resulting from an external collision. And this is a, a first equation that we have to keep in mind. The second is uh, a vector, in fact, information, still from basic principle, namely related to the generalized momentum uh, of the robot, so the product of the inertia matrix times the uh, joint velocity, so what we call P. And in fact, we know that we have a dynamics in terms of P, and this is an explicit form for the, the dynamic uh, of the generalized momentum. And you see that apart from some terms which are coming from the model, if friction was there, also friction would be present on the right hand side. Pay attention, uh, there are different signs, there's a minus G, and moreover the coriolis and centrifugal term are not as such, but we have the transpose of the matrix S, which factorize, suitably factorize, the coriolis and centrifugal term. And the most important thing is that we have a decoupled uh, relation between each, each component of the generalized momentum and each component of the total torque, joint torque being applied, coming both from the motors, uh, but also from a possible collision, as we have seen before. So, uh, just a side note here, uh, for those who are following the full, full course, uh, this is in fact uh, the same, uh, it's the vector version of the same formula that we encountered for uh, actuator FDI, or in particular uh, when we dealt with dynamic modeling and uh, we could uh, write down state equation and I mentioned that in place of Q dot you may use a state component also the generalized momentum and that would be would have been the resulting uh, equation first order equation for uh, the generalized momentum okay now um, one uh, important aspect uh, in order to get to this uh, expression we need uh, the skew symmetric property. So we need to use uh, the fact that the factorization S times Q dot, to which we are uh, representing coriolis and centrifugal term, is one that guarantees M dot minus 2 S being skew symmetric. But apart from that, this as a consequence uh, is that M dot in fact can be replaced by the sum of the S matrix and the S transpose matrix. And in fact, this is why you see the S transpose matrix appearing on the right hand side of this expression. And I would leave you uh, as an exercise to prove that this expression is correct once you start with a model that has a factorization with S that satisfied M, M dot minus 2S being a uh, skew symmetric property. The proof is quite elementary, but uh, it's interesting too work it out. Okay, so these are the relevant dynamic properties that we will use uh, in the following. And before writing down the monitoring signals that allows us to do first detection and then also isolation, let's look at the general uh, block diagram which describes what we are doing now. 
So the robot is under normal mode of operation, is doing something, so we are sending torque commands to the joints and the robot is moving. Now at some point, uh, some uh, external forces, generalized forces, will be applied so that we will have a collision and we like to detect and to isolate those collisions without using external uh, sensors or cameras or even surface uh, tactile sensors through which we can equip the robot. Pay attention that this uh, solution is being pursued at least in research laboratories. So to uh, put a sensitive scheme uh, everywhere so that we can detect forces by direct sensing you know, without using sophisticated model but in fact the sensor is quite sophisticated and quite uh, delicate I would say at this stage. So um, for doing this we send to a different let's say, um, dynamic system, in fact a software unit uh, the state of the robot, so Q and Q dot, and also the torque that we are applying. And we call this uh, dynamic system, it's a residual generator, I would call it, in fact here we call it collision monitor, that generates some signals, and these signals will be a, a, a scalar sigma, sig, uh, signal sigma, which allows to do detection, and a vector signal R, in fact, a full residual, which allows to do detection indeed, but also isolation. Now, if we computing this quantity while the robot is in normal operation, then we will continuously do a check if this signal exceeds some threshold, a scalar threshold on the absolute value of sigma, so when it exceeds a sigma collision, and uh, for the vector signal R, probably we take the norm so that we, if the norm exceeds some uh, threshold, or indeed we could also work on components, but this is just for illustration, then if this exceeds, then we have a, a yes answer, either of the two. Uh, if both of them are below threshold, then the, the collision monitor just says no and we continue to monitor operation. But if a collision has been recognized, then we activate a reaction strategy. The reaction strategy may use in particular the uh, residual R in order to change operation. So the first thing that the reaction strategy does at the control level is to deactivate the normal mode of operation okay? and let the robot react to the detected collision and possibly also to the isolated and if we had isolation in place then we could use in the reaction strategy also the signal R. The interesting thing is that uh, if we use R or even sigma only we may also recognize that the contact has gone. So that no matter how the robot uh, reacted to this, uh, there's no more uh, collision in place. So that we can reactivate the normal mode of operation. Indeed, we may have lost track of what we were doing, or we may have been able to save something of the execution of the original task, no matter which is the case, we can reactivate the normal mode of operation, uh, recovering from this collision, uh, colliding situation. Uh, another comment are the, uh, the external arrow that goes from reaction strategy to collision monitor. Because while we are reacting to a collision, a single collision we assume to have, but the robot may collide another time and another time again, but the nice thing is that we can continue to monitor collision and recognize a uh, new collision that occurs after the first one. So we have a permanent uh, monitoring of collision in place. It's not a one-shot uh, one event. We can follow this over and over. And this is very important, 
I guess. And we'll see also in some video what does this imply. So, let's now generate this uh, residual signal. Let's start with, uh, start with a scalar residual. And in fact, the scalar residual is based on monitoring the total energy of the system. So we compute the signal, which is the difference between the actual uh, energy at time uh, t and some integral of the accumulated product between uh, computable signals. So the velocity of the robot and the applied torque by the motor. So, so this coming from whatever open loop or closed loop command. Uh, and you see that uh, the sigma is also inside the, the uh, expression of the residual. Uh, and then we have to subtract some initial value of the total energy. If we start from zero, E zero will be zero. And so we can forget about that. Uh, we have to initialize the uh, residual. We initialize it at time zero. And we, this difference between the energy and this integral, in essence, apart from the initialization of E zero, uh, is being amplified by a positive gain KD. Now, it, this is, in fact, a computable signal. So we don't use tau K that we don't have, we are using only model terms and, of course, the same signal that we are generating signal. In fact, uh, you may compute this by uh, evaluating the model terms, uh, but you also can use the Newton-Euler algorithm for computing, for instance, the kinetic energy. Uh, by suitable calls, you can compute the generalized momentum and then do the product by Q dot. And so you compute uh, at least the kinetic energy. Then you have to compute the potential energy to get the uh, total uh, energy E. But in fact, uh, computation of the potential energy is simpler even for a large number of uh, degrees of freedom. So this is the definition and what you can implement in your software. Now we can look at the dynamics of the signal. Uh, we need this for analysis. So we need to know what happens to this signal if a collision occurs or not. And uh, it is easy to show that the dynamics of this uh, so the evolution of the sigma, sigma dot uh, as this form, so minus kd sigma plus kd, the product of the velocity of the robot times the joint torque resulting by collision. So if there is no collision, tau k is zero, so the dynamics will be simply sigma dot equal minus kd sigma, and if sigma starts from zero, it will remain in zero. So this is uh, very simple. But if a collision will occur while the robot is moving, at least some joint is in motion, uh, then the signal sigma will be excited by the collision. So we can detect that the collision occurs. Of course, it's a scalar, so having information on which link has collided is impossible with just this scalar signal. Now, uh, the presence of sigma in the integral and, of course, for analysis in this evolution uh, gives, a, gives to this um, residual generator the form of a stable first-order linear field. So it's the full the terms in green is exciting the collision. If the collision is gone, so if the contact is gone, so tau k has gone to zero, then uh, sigma, which is now at a certain value, will return automatically exponentially to zero with the uh, uh, time constant 1 over kd. So this allows the system to be ready for a new detection. Okay, so this is also important. Uh, if you want to implement this method, it is good to have an idea of what are the signals that uh, you're using. So this is, for instance, in a simulation in, uh, uh, in Simulin, uh, you have the following situation. So on top, on the blue part, you have the dynamics of the robot, which is evolving, the real robot or the simulated robot, if you're doing some test uh, on a simulation, in a simulation environment. The tau k is inside the robot. Of course, it's not a signal that you can hand 
over to the residual generator. Uh, but in fact, you're using Q dot and tau, and you're using Q dot and Q both for computing the scalar product of the input torque and times the velocity, and for computing the total energy, you just need Q and Q dot. Uh, you take the sigma uh, output of this generator, you compare it with uh, Q dot transpose tau, and you're generating a difference, and then you integrate this, and you compare, you subtract this from the uh, current value of the uh, energy, total energy, multiplied by the scalar gain kd, and generate sigma again. And the correct initialization of the estimator, I mean, of the monitoring signal, it's monitoring the uh, total energy, should be exactly the value of the energy at time zero. So if the robot starts at rest, uh, you initialize this to zero. And, uh, in fact, you have solved your problem. So this is the implementation of uh, the formula that we have seen before. Okay, so you can see that you can recognize here a form of observer, an observer or a monitor of the total energy of the system, and this is being used to detect the presence of a collision. Now, uh, what can we say? It's a very simple scheme. In fact, we are generating the scalar signal. It's model-based, so we need to have a good model in order to compute the total energy of the system. But uh, because of the presence of the product of uh, the tau k times the joint velocity, this shows that uh, we can only detect colliding force torques, so wrenches, that will produce work on twist at the contact. And this is uh, shown by the following um, computation. Moreover, the system, the scheme, does not succeed in detection when the robot stands still. Why? Because Q dot is equal to zero. So Q dot times tau k will be zero, at least in the first instant, unless the robot starts to move, uh, the residual will not be moved from zero. The fact that Q dot transpose tau k is associated to the work produced by the wrenches on the twists at the contact, so I'm using this terminology now, which is more contact than always saying a generalized force, which is a force and a torque, or a generalized velocity, which is a linear and angular component. So wrenches and twists are more uh, compact uh, terminologies. So you can see that tau k is in fact equal to j transpose of k f k, uh, but then you recognize that j transpose and q dot transpose j transpose of k is in fact the transpose of the velocity at the generalized of, of the twist in fact at the uh, at the contact so that uh, this is zero if and only if q dot transpose tau k is zero which means that either q dot is zero and vk is zero or that you have a velocity but the applied collision is in a, different, in a direction which is orthogonal in a uh, generalized sense, the same sense that we have seen in hybrid control to the um, motion of the robot. So this detector fails when the robot stands still or when it's moving, but the colliding force uh, on the Carti at the Cartesian level is in a direction which is orthogonal to the motion of uh, the link that is undergoing the single collision, okay? So, uh, there is some limitation. In general, this may work. It's a simple scheme, but it's not a complete one. And uh, here I have uh, an old simulation, just the result to have an idea what does sigma do. Here we, ha we simulated a 7R robot uh, moving its end effector on a Cartesian path close to the paddle was an obstacle, so that the body of the robot, while moving, may collide. In fact, after half a second, while tracing the Cartesian path with some speed, uh, 
of course this robot is redundant so depending on it may collide or not but at some point it collides and the sigma signal uh, moves out from zero and the contact is detected of course we have to place some threshold here we put threshold um, at the value about three uh, in absolute value uh, this could be interpreted as uh, an energy so this could be joule whatever so uh, when this exceeds the threshold then the contact is detected and after a while uh, the signal uh, the contact is gone and the signal returns to zero so we can establish that the uh, contact has gone when the signal is actually zero or when it becomes for a while uh, with a digital let's say filtering and uh, we have seen this before for the uh, recovery from actuator false when the false were intermittent so when it stays for a while for a number of samples below uh, the threshold then uh, we recognize that the uh, collision in this case has gone and here instead it's uh, an experiment that we conducted uh, quite after having introduced uh, the whole methodology and say because we focus more on the second type of residual signal, the vector one. But this experiment shows on a, a 6R robot what happens. So the robot uh, is either at rest or moving along a straight horizontal line under Cartesian impedance control. This is not really relevant which controller were, was applied. Just to handle, uh, just to handle possible forces occurring. Uh, moreover, we equip the end effector of the robot with a forster sensor at the wrist so that we can analyze what's going on. So you can see here uh, different plots and different uh, phases of uh, this experiment. So the first plot is position, the second is velocity in just this uh, linear uh, direction, horizontal direction. Then the force measurement by the force or sensor, this is just used for analysis, of course, we don't want to equip the robot with an additional force or sensor uh, for detecting uh, collision. By the way, we could only detect collision at the end effector level, not along the structure. Then we have the sigma, and in fact you see that this is expressed in, in, in Watt in the form of integral of energy. And then also the scalar product between the external force applied and the actual velocity of the end effector robot in that direction. Okay, so this is the setup. And now let's look at the various six phases. So we are focusing on what does the sigma signal. And in fact, you can see that it's zero most of the time, only in some phases, in particular in phase A and in phase D and in phase F, although to a minor extent, is becoming different from zero, like we have seen before in the simulation that I, in the plot of the simulation that I just showed. So in phase A, what happens? Uh, the robot is moving and the contact force is applied against the motion direction. So we have full detection. The force or sensor measures component mainly in the x direction but also a bit also in the y and z direction and there is some uh, work being produced by the external forces on the motion in fact it's stopping or trying to reduce the velocity and you see that the speed so we are still moving in the direction but uh, you see that perturbation on the speed uh, uh, between the desired one and the actual one and also in the y direction is being traced, but almost nothing happens in the y direction. So this is a classical detection where the sigma signal works. Then in phase B, no force is applied, the robot is at rest, nothing moves. In fact, you see that x is not moving, uh, it's staying constant, x dot is equal to zero, the desired and the actual one. There's a residual measurement of force because of the sensory hysteresis sigma is at zero and there is no work produced by the external force which is in fact not applied and the robot is at rest then in phase c now force increases uh, gradually 
but the robot is still at rest. It's being held by an impedance control that keeps the robot at rest despite the presence of some small force. So you see that sigma, although the force is present and is being measured by the force torque sensor so that we know that a force is being applied, but because of the no motion due to the Cartesian controller, the sigma signal stays at zero. In phase D, the robot starts moving again, uh, and you can see this from the second plot. We have a, a next dot, you have a desired velocity, uh, but in the direction of, in particular, in the direction of the applied force, uh, you see that there's a difference between the desired one and the actual one. This happens to be true also in the y direction. Uh, again, we, uh, because we are moving uh, in the x direction so for sure, and in that direction we are also um, uh, applying an external force, so the sigma again goes out of zero. So this is the same situation as before, uh, and uh, the external forces are doing the last plot, are doing some work on the motion. Uh, there's a, another situation where, at this stage, the robot stands still and the force is applied in a different direction, in fact, in the Z direction. So there's no detection. No detection because the robot stands still again, so return to zero. Now, the last phase is the very interesting one, I would say, because the robot moves in the uh, X direction. But the force is being applied in a direction which is orthogonal to the motion direction. So there's some coupling because of the inaccuracy of the application of force and so on. So you see that the signal is uh, slightly excited, the sigma signal. Uh, so you have detection, but in fact you have a poor detection because of this orthogonality. Because the fact the robot is in, move, in motion, because if q dot were zero and x dot Similarly, uh, you would not see anything as we have seen in previous phases, for instance, in phase C. Uh, but indeed, the orthogonality, while the robot is motion, uh, is the price to pay for having such a simple detection monitoring signal, no? just detection. So, uh, we move now to the uh, vector version, so to the residual vector version, and more similar to the actuating faults, uh, to a signal that we have generated for uh, actuator fault detection and isolation. So this is the momentum-based isolation of collision. So we compare uh, the generalized momentum with the integral of this signal, which includes q and q dot, which includes uh, applied torque to the robot and we subtract also the generalized momentum at time zero if this was different from zero so if we start from rest all this is gone the residual is initialized to zero as well uh, and we have a diagonal ki uh, you can recognize that in the uh, integral we have the transpose of the skew symmetric of the factorization matrix that satisfies the m dot minus 2s skew symmetric property again. So if we want to compute this, it's, this vector is computable with all information that we have on the model, on the measurement of on the robot and on the applied torque. But uh, so if we do a, a Lagrange modeling and we have all this term, we can compute this term. Uh, immediately, but of course this may, this may be very long, so if we decide to use a Newton-Euler algorithm, then you should be aware that the S transpose matrix, so the isolation of the S matrix per se, which is not part of the Cordelis centrifugal term, that would be S times Q dot, and then S times Q dot is computable by a suitable call of the standard Newton-Euler algorithm, so we need the modified one, the one which has four arguments and where we can distinguish between the uh, inner velocity and the outer velocity in the factorization. 
And in fact, uh, we need to call n times uh, in order to build the columns of the S matrix, and then we have the full S matrix, and we can do the transpose numerically and then multiply by the numerical value of Q dot. For the gravity term, we can still use the Newton algorithm as such. So we have a trade-off between computing this by recursive method numerically or evaluating the uh, symbolic expression of our model where we have the S matrix as such and therefore also the transpose uh, of it. Okay, so this is about computation. So this residual can be computed even efficiently. More details in the uh, 2017 transaction on robotics paper that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, again, for analysis, uh, what is the behavior of this vector R? And not surprisingly, we find again a decoupled dynamics because Ki has been uh, chosen uh, diagonal, sensitive directly to the joint torque tau k resulting from a collision. So this looks like exactly like a actuator torque fault, but in fact this extra torque is not missing in the actuation. Indeed, if we had also such uh, a fault, we would be in trouble. We could not distinguish an actuator fault from a collision torque, at least if we assume a rigid model. Otherwise, we could do this, and we will see it later on uh, as a comment. So, um, this is now sensitive even when the robot is standing still. As long as our joint torque is uh, sorry, our um, wrench, collision wrench, anywhere in the structure, is producing some tau k, because of course it should produce motion, like the joint torque will produce motion. If we are hitting at the base of the robot, where no motion will result from this collision, of course, this method can be not, I mean, it will generate uh, nothing, and we should then resort to sensory information, either tactile sensing or a camera that observes that this collision has occurred. But then it's a different story. So on board, uh, we have still this limitation, but generically, uh, th this collision uh, will be detected as soon as tau k is different from zero. Uh, so this is uh, our signal, there's no modulating velocity in this um, format. And in fact, if we, and the dynamics is fully linear, by the way, so we can also write the Laplace transform exactly like we did for faults in the uh, joint actuation, because at this stage we have reconducted the problem, so we have uh, n decoupled first order linear filters with unitary gain and excited by a generic collision which does not occur at the joint, it occurs somewhere but as soon as at least one of the uh, joint is being affected then the residual will be, uh, the associated residual will increase and of course multiple residual will be activated uh, for uh, collisions that occur downward in the uh, serial kinematic chain constituting the robot manipulator. Because of the structure of a filter, as soon as tau k is going back to zero, because we are in a post interfering phase, also the residual will go to zero, so we can uh, recognize that collision is gone, and we can also use R for the reactive phase uh, as long as R is present. Okay, uh, similarly to the previous case, this is the block diagram of the um, residual generator. Again, initialization of the block of integrals, as many as the number of joints. Uh, so the p hat of zero should be equal to the p of zero, so zero if the robot starts at rest, and otherwise the computation is very similar. So once you have seen the first of this scheme, I'm sure that you understand all of them, and therefore you are able also to uh, reconstruct properly the formula in your system and also in a simulation environment, Simulink or Python or whatever. 
So there's no longer needs to comment. Again, Ki is positive and, uh, and uh, diagonal. Now, some analysis of this. Indeed, if there are no noisy signal, no uncertainty in the model, and you can pump up the gain Ki, let's say going to infinity or to a very large value, then the residual will reproduce whatever story of tau k. Indeed, if tau k remains constant, pay attention, tau k not fk, you know, so the joint torque resulting from the collision will uh, become a constant, then r will converge to tau k because the filter has unitary gain after some transient, which is short, even if ki is not that large. Of course, the larger it is, the faster r will converge to tau k. Otherwise, it will track, so the after tau k, closer enough to substitute in our analysis r by tau k or vice versa. So we take r as a proxy of the joint torque re resulting from collision. Now, what about the isolation? This is very important. So, uh, because we know that tau k has the structure of j k transpose, even if we don't know JK transpose, and we don't know FK that generated this, but if this is the case, so, uh, because R is similar to tau K, and tau K has always this structure, then if, uh, from static consideration, if the uh, residual uh, will have non-zero component up to a certain index, let's say the index I, then, and then afterward, all zeros, then we know that the collision has generically, so modulo some singular situation, occurred in an area which is up to the height limit. So this is the type of isolation that we are able to achieve. Okay? So we can exclude that the collision occurred, and this is for sure, occurred, at link i plus 1, i plus 2, and so on, up to n, if those components of the residual vector are zero. On the other hand, all the lower components have been activated, and in fact, uh, we can understand that we could react to uh, the collision by moving mainly those joints that have been uh, affected, let's say, by the joint torque coming from the collision. So this is a kind of an involved uh, reason, but if you reason about it, we will see that we have an immediate uh, consequence of the use of R as a reaction strategy. At the moment, we just can say that before, be, beside detection, we have also some isolation properties. So this directional information is very important. I commented this before putting this on the slide, but it's actually what I just said. So uh, this directional information can be used in the reaction, let's say, in the post-impact phase, so the few milliseconds after the contact. So uh, this is, in fact, the reaction. Uh, the reaction. So once we have uh, recognized a collision with sigma or r or with both, and we have a yes now, we will use this information within the reaction strategy. So we have deactivated the normal mode of operation and we are sending to the robot a tau r, which is different from the original tau. As soon as the monitor says that collision is over, of course we can deactivate the normal mode of operation and the collision monitor in this uh, modified uh, block diagram uh, from the original one uh, received information on the internal robot state and on the control command. So, what type of reaction strategy you can imagine? First of all, in order not to bias the reaction to this collision from gravity, we will always use a zero gravity operative mode. So we will cancel gravity every time. Probably we were canceling gravity also before, while moving the robot under the action of some feedback controller, regulator, or trajectory tracking. But certainly, when we decide to react, 
Now, the tau will contain always a cancellation of light, plus a tau prime, which may be different. So, as soon as, soon as uh, we detect uh, a collision, in fact, we are now working with the isolator signal R, so R is over some threshold, in norm or in component-wise, then we activate this reaction strategy as said. So, we could do several things. So, the strategy zero that we use as baseline to comparison is that we don't react at all. So, the robot tries to continue its originally planned task and motion, which could be a disaster. But, indeed, this is the zero strategy. The strategy one is just stop the robot. So, in a sense, uh, although we could even isolate the link at which the collision occurred, but just only detect, so no matter if we are using sigma or R or both, uh, then we stop the robot motion. How do we stop as quickly as possible robot motion? Well, we could, if the robot is equipped with brakes, we could break the system. However, if you break the system, typically, uh, in an industrial setting, this is an alarm situation. So you cannot recover from this situation. You have to restart the system uh, from scratch. Uh, so this is something that you would like to avoid. So the other way of breaking without using the brake, which is an alarm, is to stop the generation of reference motion. So you keep the same, the, the last value of the desired position of the joint that you were executing while doing the trajectory. So you take the, let's say, the before last uh, value, and then you switch to a high gain position control, keeping that value forever. So the robot will stop, but still operate under position control. So you may command the robot to restart if you realize that things has, have gone. So this is a very basic different operative condition. Breaking will uh, induce an alarm and a stop, a definite stop of the robot. You have to restart from scratch. Unless the robot has a safety mode that allows using the brakes even uh, without releasing control on the system, in a sense. Okay. But the most common situation is switch to high gain position control keeping the last position, uh, let's say, frozen, okay, so the last reference position generated. Okay, so these are no reaction and a very trivial stop reaction. What about the most interesting one? What I call a reflex strategy. So now you have to use the full residual, uh, the R signal. So before, apart from uh, compensating gravity, the tau prime is proportional with the diagonal to the residual itself. Okay, so this is again, I'm using in the reaction the residual that has been used or is being used to detect and isolate collision. Why do I call this reflex strategy? Because, in fact, apart from let's say letting the robot float in a zero gravity situation, we are commanding a joint torque which is like R in the same direction of tau k. So on the same direction of the torque resulting from collision. It's like if we are exaggerating, you know, exaggerating the effect of a contact force in the Cartesian space, whatever point of the structure, at the joint level. So we are really amplifying the effect of this. So, this is a reflex strategy because, in fact, if you hit something uh, and you have a force against your arm, then it, you retract the arm uh, exactly in the same direction of the force that you have experienced at the Cartesian level. Uh, of course, you do this at the Cartesian level. Uh, in fact, you're doing this at the joint level because it's there where your uh, actuation occurs and where your muscle operate. So you're moving the joints, but in fact, the effect is moving away uh, at the Cartesian level, uh, your uh, 
from the contact area. Okay. Now, this reflex strategy, uh, I cannot show at this moment uh, in this lecture uh, any result for a fully rigid robot, although we have done this on the universal robot, which can be considered as a robot with rigid transmission. Uh, but we will see that this reflex strategy then takes on, so we are using the residual, takes on various modality if we move to a system which has joint elasticity, like the DLR uh, lightweight arm and the KUKA as well, the KUKA lightweight arm as well. So there are, at that stage, then there are slight variation of this reflex strategy, but the principle is always the same. In fact, if you go back to the rigid case and you're looking at, you substitute to tau, uh, tau prime plus jq, where tau prime is kr times tau k, and in fact it's kr times the residual, but you make the substitution, the proxy, that the residual is the tau k, then uh, the reaction of the robot is exactly uh, the following. So the model in the closed loop in the reaction phase can be reorganized in this. So gravity is gone out of the picture. Uh, you may have Cordell's centrifugal term still there. Uh, you have the inertia matrix. But then uh, on the right hand side is the collision torque that is moving the arm. And the KR is acting as its inverse, as reducing the effective robot inertia. So, in fact, uh, the KR, the fact that you're moving in the same, uh, along the same torque, you're giving the same torque along the one that is resulting from the collision, is like reducing, reducing the effective robot inertia. So, the same amount of collision torque will push away, uh, accelerate more the robot because the robot looks lighter. Uh, because this uh, identity plus KR with KR large will divide, uh, will divide component by component the inertia and all the other terms so that the acceleration can be, as a result, much larger. So it's like saying uh, you have a cow, this is your original robot, uh, this is being hit by an external force, so you let the cow react like a frog that jump away. So this is a pictorial view, of course, completely qualitative, uh, completely rule of thumb, but just to understand why we are using the residual uh, in a, uh, as a reacting uh, strategy. Okay, so uh, I would like to uh, move on to showing you actual results, because otherwise you don't believe that this works fine. So, uh, at that time uh, we implemented this method, and it was around 2006-2008, on the lightweight robot of DLR, the lightweight robot 3, you can see it on the right hand side, it's a blue color, but you can recognize that this is exactly the KUKA lightweight 4, which is the, uh, let's say, the uh, outsourcing of the results that we developed for research uh, together with the colleagues at DLR. So the first results uh, date back many years ago and now, nowadays, have become an industrial product because in fact KUKA acquired the rights to use our algorithm uh, and uh, is uh, using it uh, probably with some modification but no, it's not really relevant in their industrial robot of the lightweight type. So, uh, that robot had harmonic drives uh, and therefore elastic joints, but was also equipped with joint torque sensor. So, there's an extra sensor in fact, but it's on an onboard sensor which is used for general control. So, it's the same sensor suite that the robot has, also not for detecting and reacting to collision, just for doing motion. The dynamic model of the uh, robot with elastic joint, we have seen this as an example uh, of a variation. 
uh, you can under simplifying assumption, the so-called spawn assumption, uh, we neglect some term in the angular energy of the uh, rotor of the motors, supposing that the reduction ratio is large is a good approximation. In fact, uh, the model looks like the rigid model for the first set of equations. These are the so-called link equation. On the right hand side, however, you don't have the actuating torque tau, but you have the uh, joint elastic torque, which are in fact written below are the stiffness of the joints times the difference between the motor position and the link position. K is the diagonal matrix uh, of high value, I would say, for harmonic drive. For variable stiffness uh, actuation, you have the similar model, but K can be modulated and can be also very much reduced with respect to the case of harmonic drives. So, uh, on the first equation, you have, however, also the uh, joint torque due to the link collision, like in the rigid case. In the rigid case, you had uh, the first equation with the tau, and you add the tau k. Instead, the motor torque commands now act on the motor, so on the second set of equations, which are linear, uh, which are, in fact, the motor dynamics with the inertia of the motors times the acceleration of the motors, and then the elastic torques, which happens to be on different side or on the same side with opposite sign because uh, joint elasticity or the principle of action and reaction act on the motor and on the link in opposite direction. And the elastic torques which are being measured directly by the joint torque sensor in this robot are simply k times theta minus q, so they appear on both sides. Now uh, you can see that we have a slightly different situation here, but the implementation of the residual method, in particular of the, of the residual, uh, both the scalar one and the vector one, but I will show you only the momentum-based method, uh, can be done by the measurement. Now, there's a, another very important observation here. Uh, we mentioned that friction should be negligible, or if not, in the rigid case, it should be you should model and include it and use it everywhere like the gravity term and, and the other term that you use in the receiver. However, if you're moving to a joint elastic case, because of the particular construction of the VLR lightweight robot and also of the uh, following generation of KUKA lightweight arms, the friction at the link side is in fact negligible. The, ha the heavy friction is on the motor side. This is an important observation, because if you don't use the motor part in your computation, then the upper part is actually all that it is, because friction is negligible there. Okay? Uh, in addition, what are the measurements uh, that you have? In fact, there is some redundancy in the, there was some redundancy in the LDR system, because we had a motor position measurement by encoders, we had a link side position measurement as well, uh, and we had also uh, a joint elastic torque measurement. In our experiment, we used only the motor position and the elastic joint torque. Wherever we need Q, we use the uh, expression of the elastic joint torque as a function of the stiffness of the joint and of the motor and the link position. So Q are solved from the linear equation of the elastic torque simply by saying theta minus k to the minus 1 tau j. So we are using, in fact, theta and tau j, tau j as such, as you will see, and theta and tau j to get a measurement of Q. There was, there is also, in fact, in the robot, this is an exploded joint of the uh, generic uh, joint of the LVR3 robot, you can see that there are many components, everything is on board, very sp specially designed, lightweight, and even for the motor components. But here uh, you see the three sensor that we we'll use, the joint or sensor with its digital interface, the position sensor on the motor side, 
But also there is a Hall effect link position sensor that has not been used because it's less uh, reliable. It's used as a backup, but it's less reliable than the position sensor on the motor side and on the joint or sensor. Moreover, the harmonic drive is in between and is the source of joint elasticity for which the model that we have seen is more uh, important. Now, how do you do collision isolation? Huh? Directed isolation, the most difficult problem for this type of elastic joint robot. There are a few alternatives that you can explore. The easiest one, and the one that we implemented first, the simplest one, is to use, to take advantage of the joint or sensor, and in fact, take the same expression of the uh, um, residual for the rigid case, namely using the link dynamics equation only, the one where friction is not present because it's really negligible at that side of the elasticity. So replace the tau, the commanded torque, with the measurement from the elastic torque. So the expression of the residual, which now I label as REJ, just to remember that EJ stands for elastic joint case, but in fact the expression is exactly the same as in the rigid case. The only difference is the red symbol where we are using the uh, measurement of the elastic torque rather than the commanded torque like in the rigid case. And the dynamics of this new residual is exactly the dynamics that we expect. So I don't need to comment this any longer. Indeed, uh, if you didn't have a joint or sensor, but still joint elasticity, which is the case of the so-called serial elastic actuation or variable elastic joint, many times you don't have a joint or sensor there, then you have two alternatives. One alternative is to use position measurement at both sides of the elasticity, so of theta and of q, and then you need to know the joint stiffness k through which you reconstruct the signal tau j, which is the elastic torque that you don't measure directly, but you can recompute through that. And then you can proceed as before. This is the common use. There's also another alternative. You can modify the residual by adding not only the momentum of the link, which is the p as m of q times q dot, but also the motor momentum in the expression, which is Vm times theta dot. And then using the commanded torque in place of the tau j. You can show that the dynamics is exactly the same as before. The only problem is that in this case, since you're using both equations, because you're using also the motor momentum, and therefore in the analysis and the, in the expression, you need to use also the motor equation, not only the link equation, the motor equation will be affected by motor friction. So you need to estimate value or compensate completely with a different method, which can be done, as we have seen uh, in the previous lecture on actuator faults. The same method on the motor side can be used to compensate friction. But anyway, you have to handle, deal with friction. Modeling and including it or compensating it with another residual, which is designed on the link side, on the motor side of the problem. So there are these two alternatives, but we will, so you can implement in particular, uh, the first one maybe is simpler, but uh, you can uh, implement it in place of this if you don't have a joint or sensor. So this is not really a limitation. Indeed, uh, in the presence of joint elasticity, also motion control as a whole is more difficult if you want to regulate uh, to a position or uh, to a desired position of the motor or of the link, if you want to track a link trajectory, you have more complexity. So even in our case, the reactive part uh, is slightly, can take different flavor, although all similar to, to, to the, uh, all similar to the re reflex strategy. So uh, we will see that different strategies are of reaction are possible. And in fact, we have implemented all of them and also compared them on the lightweight robot 3 of DLR. So uh, we start with a general control law which uses full state feedback. And in fact, this is the controller that is being used uh, by DLR for their uh, motion control. 
And this uses uh, motor position and velocity or uh, some numerical derivative obtained from the motor encoders, uh, the joint elastic torque which is being measured and also its derivative. This constitutes in fact a, a new set of states. Instead of uh, motor and link position and velocity, you have motor position and velocity, joint elastic torque and its derivative. This represents a full state for the system. And here you see that the generic torque controller for this robot uses the motor position error with the KP, then uh, damping out the motor velocity with the KD, then an elastic joint torque error, the tau J desired minus uh, the measure of joint torque multiplied by a different gain, and then damping also uh, this uh, derivative numerically obtained plus an elastic joint torque feedforward command for doing tracking. So I'm presenting this because in fact the reaction, the various reactions are implemented by choosing proper value for these quantities, in particular for the Kp, for the tau Jd, uh, and that's it. Okay. Now the zero gravity condition that we mentioned should compensate gravity. However, gravity is present on the link dynamic while we have a command on the joint on the motor side. So we cannot really cancel directly. So we cancel it in many different approximate ways. Uh, the one that was implemented at DLR was just using the motor position measurement. So it was reconstructing the JQ by measuring the motor position and computing a J bar term uh, by an, 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 uh, a contraction mapping, an iterative scheme, uh, very quickly, at every sampling time, uh, you were feeding uh, the theta that you measure from the motor into the balance equation, the static equation uh, that you see on the right hand side, which on the link side, when nothing is moving, so in a quasi static situation, this is the approximation. Uh, this boils down when q dot and q double dot are zero to k of theta minus q equal j of q. So you're feeding the measure theta and you're computing, you're solving this numerical equation by contraction, starting from the previous q that you have. In fact, this is very efficient. So in two, three iteration, you get a new q which is associated to the theta. And you're using this q, which is not measured but it's obtained from the measurement of the motor position uh, in the expression of G. And so you're uh, replacing, you're compensating in this quasi-static approximate way, the gravity. So uh, we have everything in place to introduce the reaction strategies for the elastic joint case. Uh, the first, so remember the strategy zero is continue to do whatever you were doing. The strategy one is just stop the robot by uh, stopping the breaking it or uh, breaking the joint or better stopping the uh, motion generation the desired motion to the previous value of configuration qd and hi using high gain to stop the robot at that position so the strategy zero and strategy one strategy two is just floating so putting the robot in a zero gravity condition so the feed-forward torque that we are um, sending to the previous full-state controller is just this approximate gravity compensation. And we don't give a reference position, so we put Kp equal to zero so that we could go everywhere. We just float without gravity uh, under the action of uh, the collision. The Strategy three now is the closest one to what we called reflex strategy in the rigid case. In fact, we call it reflex torque reaction here. Again, Kp is set equal to zero. You compensate gravity, but you add in the desired joint torque also a term which is proportional to the uh, momentum residual, the Rej in this case. So this is very close to that gravity compensation plus proportional to the residual reaction. So it's the closest to the rigid case. We have also another modality which is called admittance mode reaction. 
So uh, you still compensate in the tau j desired uh, the gravity. You keep the kp, so you keep a proportional a, a, a motion controller, but you assign as reference velocity the uh, reaction to the uh, residual with a different kr. It's called kr theta. Which means that as, long, as soon as the residual goes to zero because collision is no longer there, the robot will stop because the theta desired velocity will be zero. Okay, so these are the options together with strategy zero, no reaction, and strategy one, just stop. Of course, you can have farther possible reaction in, 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 in these cases. Uh, combining strategy or using impedance control, uh, research has proceeded along this direction using the concept of uh, momentum-based residual for isolating uh, collision. Uh, two interesting things that we have done is time scaling. So trying to preserve, uh, trying to preserve some uh, reaction, as some part of the task. So you don't give up the path at the Cartesian level, typically, but also at the joint level. You just stop the time or reverse the time. So you move back on the same path that you were tracing when you get uh, a collision. And if you have somebody pushing you back, you retract. And as soon as the contact has gone, you recover the same path. So you're giving up only the time. Or uh, you try, and in the presence of redundancy, you could do this. Uh, you have a collision somewhere. The end effector is doing a task. You try to preserve the task of the end effector while accommodating the reacting torque in the new space of some uh, dynamic behavior. And this is a very important and very interesting situation that we will uh, see through uh, some video. So, uh, we made the first experiment using a, a dummy head, uh, so something that mimics, let's say, the skull of the human uh, with some accelerometer mounted on it, because the accelerometer is the first thing that we notice the contact. So we are not using this for reacting, just for comparing strategy. And the robot is moving uh, first horizontally, uh, moving the first joint at 30 degrees per second and therefore the end effector uh, with a linear velocity which is proportional to the stretch of the arm which is about uh, 1.5 meter um, along the horizontal direction. So we use this for uh, setup. And here you see uh, some video. Uh, first strategy zero. You see that this video were uh, run at, um, at DLR, you see the dummy head on the right, so the reaction, no reaction, is just moving the robot, the robot and the factor should go uh, in a position which is slightly beyond uh, the uh, dummy head, and no reaction occurs, so that quite slowly we hit the head of the uh, emulated human and uh, of course we damage it. Now strategy two is the first reactive one uh, with rather low velocity so the robot uh, will uh, go in a float the reaction but in fact it will just stop because uh, there will be no contact any longer. So let's see what happens. We touch, but we immediately stop, and the robot now is floating. So if you move it around, it will just follow you as a reaction to a new force. You see that the monitoring of collision is still going on. So we first hit the dummy head, and then we react, and we stop. But since we are in the floating mode, uh, we continue monitor if there are new collision. In fact, if you keep it by the hand, uh, and move it around, it will just follow you uh, in a passive way. It's just like the joystick without a force or sensor. Uh, not, not, not bad as a behavior. 
Now, uh, how, how, how long will it take to detect collision? So, because we had the accelerometer mounted on the dummy head, we could also make uh, a measurement, an accurate measurement of what happens, sample by sample, uh, with a sampling time of one millisecond, uh, to the various signals. So, here you see a colored trace, the detection uh, on, off, let's say the zero one index for detection is the uh, magenta one on top and the first thing, then uh, the red one is the measured joint torque and surprisingly for us at that moment uh, this signal is not really sensitive in the first few instants. Uh, the residual is the blue one which is oscillating because of noise so there should be a threshold and the green one is the dummy head acceleration which is zero because we don't touch the head while moving and it's the signal that the first one that goes out of zero when you have a hit so uh, when you see at the uh, millisecond 0 0.496 seconds so 496 millisecond after the start of the experiment uh, we can say that there is a collision and the accelerometer of course measures something the residual stays still uh, for a couple of uh, sample at zero and then start increasing. Okay, so there is a delay in computation, but the delay is uh, of the order of milliseconds, so of two, four sampling time, which is quite good. Okay, uh, indeed, if you had increased the KI, uh, the gain of the residual, you may have seen this uh, one step ahead, but then you would have increased also the noise in the normal condition. So this is just a qualitative idea or even a quantitative idea of how fast you achieve reaction. Uh, because you wanted now to compare uh, the strategy in a quite repetitive way so that the environment is always the same, we have we decided to also make some balloon impact experiment. So we fixed the balloon, uh, we, we inflated several balloons, uh, having the idea that the balloon, uh, for while tuning the gains, may explode, so we need a, a replacement, but in fact this never happened. Okay, So uh, we, at this stage, we stage, the balloon is also compliant, so we could also expect some, uh, uh, increase some uh, um, velocity, so the speed, so that the contact could occur with higher energy, but still we have a compliant environment in this case. So this was, a, again, a preliminary experiment where you could compare things. And you see here some snapshot of one video, the robot falls down on the balloon, uh, hit the balloon, press on the balloon, then react and goes away. Okay, and the various reaction using the various strategy. Um, First, let's see a balloon impact with the strategy four, the admittance mode reaction that we have not seen uh, before. Uh, so far we have seen strategy zero, two, and now strategy four. So we have a faster uh, motion at 90 degrees per second in a coordinated motion, so we don't care about the individual point, and the heat will be close to the end effect. So you see that it hits, uh, press a bit, force is being generated, the residual increases, the reaction is by admitted mode, the value of the residual is given by is given to uh, the desired velocity, then as soon as the robot leaves contact, the residual goes to zero, the velocity goes to zero, the robot stops. Rather in a, um, let's say, um, impulsive way, okay? rather a stiff stop uh, in, in case of admittance mode. Now, we did uh, several other experiments with the balloon impact and now I just show the uh, comparison of the profile of the residual at joint four, remember that there are as many components at joint, and of the associated velocity of joint four uh, with this balloon impact using different strategies. So on the left hand side you see the residual which is uh, proxy to a torque 
a joint torque. On the right hand side, you see a velocity profile. You see that the velocity profile for the joint was a kind of a trapezoidal one. And then uh, the residual on the left hand side, all residual for all strategy are zero, more or less sensitive to noise while moving. First, no motion, they are all zero. Then you see that they are kept between a three to four uh, newton meter, which is the original threshold that we are using. And then all of a sudden, all jump up while the velocity goes to zero, around 0 0.5 seconds. Now, the first, the, uh, the strategy zero is no stop. So continue to do, and the final positioning was inside, a bit inside the balloon. So if you don't react, you stop because the motion is completed, but you keep contact with the balloon. So this is in fact the torque, about 35 Newton meters, that is being felt at steady state uh, at joint four because we are pushing on the balloon with the end effect. And on the other side, you see that the magenta profile, there will be some motion and then everything stops quite immediately. Okay? So there's no reaction and I'm keeping contact. Imagine that uh, instead of the balloon, you were the one being hit uh, with no reaction and you're not so soft as a balloon, uh, you will have a high force on your, let's say, body uh, although, and the robot stops and nothing happens. So this is not really a nice situation. Uh, the second strategy would just react and stop. So here you see strategy one. So you react and stop, but still you're in contact with the balloon and in fact you're pressing the balloon and the equivalent force uh, of pressure at the balloon at joint four is 10 newton meters. So still quite large. Uh, with all other strategy, in fact, you bring back the uh, residual to zero, which means that you detach from the balloon. So really you react, re reflexing with different modality, the admittance mode, the reflex mode. Um, in, in every case, you bring back the residual uh, to zero and you stop. And in fact, the fastest stop is, is uh, obtained with the admittance mode. Uh, the other two are the, the yellow one, strategy two is the floating, so compensating gravity and letting the robot uh, move uh, accordingly. Uh, and the uh, strategy three is the closest to the rigid case, is the uh, reflex strategy. You see that the behavior of the residual on the left between the green and the yellow plots is pretty much similar. On the other side, instead, you see that uh, the fastest reaction uh, using the residual is the admittance, followed by the floating, and then followed by the uh, reflex, which is gives a more smooth behavior. And in fact, I like the most the strategy three, as it will be seen in the following video. Uh, this is me some years ago, uh, and uh, on the left hand side, this is the first impact at 60 degrees per second, so quite fast motion. Uh, on the left hand side, in admittance mode, in the on the right hand side, strategy three, the reflex torque mode. Remember that in both cases, uh, if contact uh, is released, so after the collision, the residual goes to zero and the robot will stop anyway. But it's ready to monitor new collisions. So you will see in this video the first impact and then what happens uh, in reaction to new forces applied now by me on purpose on the structure in admittance mode or in reflex torque mode. And you can tell pretty much the difference, especially in the following phase. So this is the heat, stop, I was pretty much impressed and everybody in the lab was impressed. In fact, everybody wanted to try it later. And you see that uh, I can push and the robot goes away and stops. Stops pretty soon because as soon as the residual goes to zero, the desired velocity in the admittance mode controller, remember, 
admittance mode is giving a velocity proportional to the force. Here the force is not measured, but it's reconstructed from the residual. No? There's no joint torque sensing at this stage, not even along the... Uh, sorry, sorry, there's no explicit force sensing. There is the joint torque sensing, but in fact the same strategy could be applied to a rigid case. So this is just a, a, a way for going around. And uh, the reflex torque strategy, instead, you will see a much smoother reactive behavior after the first impact and also the following contact. You see that the robot is slowly moves away. In fact, you, you get very much dependability here because you trust what you're doing. You can move around softly the robot uh, in a very smooth way. In fact, uh, this is uh, the repetition of the same experiment, but with a higher uh, speed at the first impact. And please note that uh, the way in which the robot reacts, so in the reflex mode, is different. So it's not going back along the same trajectory. It's just reacting and we are amplifying the motion at the joint level uh, with our reflex strategy, remember, uh, letting the robot see even... even uh, lighter than before. And this is the effect of the reflex strategy. And depending on how you impact my arm, you will uh, react. So you, not necessarily you going back, you may slide along the arm and you may have different type of reaction. All natural, like the contact force that you are exerting. And this is what happened here. And then from there on, uh, okay, you can tell the different contact and collision occurred. Okay, uh, I think that uh, this long uh, lecture, is, we make a break now, so this first part stops here.